All right, assalamu alaikum and good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's Iftar program presented by the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community of Richmond. My name is Salam Bhatti and I'll be emceeing tonight's event. As is customary in all of our events, we will begin the program with a recitation from the Holy Quran, which will be in Arabic, followed by its English translation. So I would like to ask Javed Iqbal from our Richmond chapter to please uh, offer a few verses from the Holy Quran. <laughs> oh, Javid, we cannot hear you. I could not hear you because my volume was on low. Please continue. A'uzu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem Bismillahir rahmanir rahim Ya Kutiba <laughs> فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيزًا وَلَا سَفَرٍ فَإِتَّتُمْ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ وَأَلَى الَّذِينَ يُتِيكُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ تَعَامُ فمن تتوب خيرا فهو خير لك وأن تسوم خير لكم إن كنتم علمون شهر رمان الذي أنزل فيه القوة All right, thank you, Javed. And for the English translation, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Rahman Ahmed uh, to please uh, explain what just uh, uh, Javed is. Assalamu alaikum. Um, the recitation that was just given was from the Holy Quran, chapter 2, verses 184 to 186. A'uz wa shaitan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-Rahman which translates to, I seek refuge from Allah, from Satan, the rejected. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, ever merciful. O ye who believe, fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you, so that you may guard against evil. The prescribed fasting is for a fixed number of days, but whoso among you is sick or is on a journey shall fast the same number of other days. And for those who are able to fast only with great difficulty is an expiation the feeding of a poor man, and whoso does good of his own accord, it is better for him, and fasting is good for you, if you only knew. The month of Ramadan is that in which the Quran was revealed, as a guidance for a mankind with clear proof of guidance and discrimination. Therefore, whosoever of you is present at home in this month, let him fast therein. 
But whoso is temporarily sick or is on a journey shall fast the same number of other days. Allah desires ease for you, and he desires not hardship for you. And he desires that you may complete the number and that you may exalt Allah for his have guided you and that you may be grateful. Jazakallah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, as you heard, uh, what Rahman translated were the verses from the Holy Quran, which tell Muslims about the commandment of fasting during the month of Ramadan, which is something we are all doing right now. Now, today I began the program by saying, Assalamu Alaikum. And this is an Arabic greeting that Muslims say to each other. And it sounds a lot like something that I hope all of you are thinking at the end of today's program. Salam, I like him. So Assalamu Alaikum translates to peace be upon you. And the reply is Wa Alaikum Salam and on you be peace as well. And of course, uh, throughout the program, if you have any questions about Ramadan or about Islam, feel free to send them to me in our chat. And afterwards, uh, after uh, the Imam has spoken, uh, we will have a question answer session as time allows. Now, earlier I mentioned the uh, Ahmadiyya Muslim community, and you might be wondering what those words mean. So to explain, here's a five minute video. So sit back, grab some popcorn if you're not fasting, and relax and enjoy this short video. Also enjoy me trying to find this video on the Zooms. Let's see here. Uh, the founders of the world's religions prophesied about a time when a Messiah would appear. A Messiah who would plant a seed to revive man's connection with his creator a seed that would flourish into a global movement, bringing about a new dawn and hope for a brighter future. This seed was sown under divine guidance in the small town of Qadian in India by Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, peace be upon him, the Messiah, in 1889. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community is a revival movement within Islam emphasizing its essential teachings of peace, love, justice, and sanctity of life. Through the institution of Caliphate, a system of spiritual successorship, the message of the promised Messiah has spread to the ends of the earth, with members numbering tens of millions from over 200 nations. The message reached the shores of the United States on February 15, 1920, with the arrival of the movement's first missionary to America, Hazrat Mufti Muhammad Sadiq. May Allah be pleased with him. From humble beginnings, Mufti Sadiq immediately set to work, inviting people of all backgrounds to accept the Messiah of the age and to form a universal brotherhood, bridging social, economic, and racial divides that were rife in the country. Over the decades, the movement gained momentum, embodying its motto of love for all, hatred for none. We must try to unify men, and that can be done with reference to the existence of one and only God, and by bringing mankind closer to God. This house of God was built with this your intention. The path of salvation is never an easy one, but the movement continues to march forward, overcoming all challenges, with members continuing to sacrifice their time, their earnings, and even their lives for the cause. But this is life. We have to fight it out. Whatever may happen, we must continue resolutely and march forward on the path of achievement of peace. It is 
is an honor to be in the same room with you. Thank you for bringing us all together to honor you and for the work that you have led us in to build a better future. Thank you, Your Holiness. Thank you, Your Holiness. The acts of terrorism or extremism have nothing whatsoever to do with the true teachings of Islam. His Holiness actually said that to us. I almost started to cry. <laughs> I almost started to cry from hearing him say that we will wipe your tears. That's when you go out there as the MD community does worldwide better than any sect of Islam today through all their humanitarian and all their charity works. This is true Islam. The mantra or motto of uh, love for all, hatred for none, is something that we all as human beings can uh, embrace. And at the end of the day, it's about love, compassion, justice, and that's what we need. I think that God sent this mosque to this neighborhood and to this city. I really do believe that the things that we are struggling with, the difficulties we struggle with, can be helped by positive people and positive role models. Indeed, for over a century, your community has been a shining star in our twinkling constellation of American faiths. We hold genuine love for all people and are ever ready to extend a hand of friendship to others. And I've seen them outreach to the community in many different ways. So just as the Khalifa talked about, I saw it put into practice. So I was very familiar with what he was saying. As long as we care about each other, as long as we are sincere, and as long as we are honest, we will all be okay. By God's grace, 2020 marks the centennial celebration of the Ahmadiyya movement in Islam here in the United States of America. We thank you for joining us on this joyous occasion and welcome you to the next century of our movement. All right, and we're back. Thank you so much for uh, checking out that um, uh, five minute video about who we are and what we do and why we are here. Uh, so there's a, a lot to take in and of course that final message of how we are celebrating 100 years this year. And as we celebrate those 100 years, we look back and we reflect on the power of prayer during these trying times and the trying times we saw 100 years ago as well. And as the world was recovering from the 1918 flu, the first Muslim missionary of our community was getting ready to arrive in America from the shores of the most remote part of India. India. During the early days of our movement in America, it was the intense prayers of these early Muslim missionaries that enabled our community to lay the seeds of Islam in America a century ago by building America's oldest mosque, delivering a, me a message of racial equality and social justice, and caring for the welfare of all Americans. And all that history brings us to today, something that all of you are now a part of. Today, we are joined by an incredible audience from all parts of Virginia and all parts of the country, excellent guest speakers, and uh, my, my second child, my sourdough starter. So please give him a warm welcome, a 75 degree warm welcome, please, so that he can grow into something great. Uh, our, our first speaker tonight is uh, someone who is newly special to our mosque. And due to redistricting that happened within the past couple of years, Delegate Kirk Cox now represents the district where our mosque is in Chesterfield. Now, Delegate Cox has served in the House of Delegates since 1990. He was a high school teacher teaching government until he retired in 2012. He lives in Colonial Heights and, with his wife and together they have four sons. Because Delegate Cox retired in 2012, he hasn't had the opportunity to address classes through Zoom. So we are happy to kind of give him that opportunity today and welcome him today to share some remarks. Uh, Delegate Cox, the floor is yours. Well, thanks, Salam. I appreciate it. I'm delighted to be the delegate for your mosque. You got the Zoom thing down pretty good. I I'm impressed. 
I like to be with y'all personally, but I think you're doing pretty good handling all that technology. Uh, I don't want to take too much of your time. You got a lot of great speakers today, but I do want to specifically say thank you to the Ahmadi uh, Muslim community of Richmond for your, inv your, inv your invaluable charity work in the region. And as you said, really congrats on your centennial 100 year celebration. You know, all faiths believe in service to others. And it's part of what makes the Metro Richmond area such a great place to live and raise a family. Earlier this year, Salam, you were nice enough to stop by the Capitol and give me a great preview of so much you're doing in our community. So for, whether it's clean up the James River, volunteering at local food pantries, your great work for the homeless, it's so commendable. And then recently I learned of your efforts to make face masks during the ongoing COVID-19 crisis. You know, during these really trying times, you've impacted so many people, and, and I dare say, so many people that you don't even know about. So just a heartfelt thank you. Uh, I know that uh, this is a very special time for everyone in the Muslim community. And on behalf of the Virginia General Assembly and Kirk Cox from the 66th District, I wanna thank you uh, for all your great volunteerism, your great faith. That's what sustains us in times like this. And finally, I wish you and your family a Ramadan Mubarak. Thank you, Salam. Thanks, Delia Cox, uh, for your very kind remarks. I just want to give you a pop quiz really quick. Uh-oh. If the quarantine, if everything ended tomorrow, what would be the first thing you would do on Monday? The first thing I would do on Monday, oh my gosh, uh, I think the very first thing I'd probably do, it's going to sound crazy, uh, I'd go to the beach because I have two sons who are ocean lifeguards and I like to go see him and I can't go see him. So that's what I would do. Strange, probably first thing you would do. But we, let's hold on to that hope so we can all go back. Yeah, that'd be fun in the sun. Thanks. Let's do it. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker comes from uh, the neighboring district just south of our mosque. Delegate Lashree's Aird has served in the House of Delegates since 2016. Her election made her the youngest woman elected to Virginia's House of Delegates. She also works as the president of William and Mary's Richard Bland College Chief of Staff. Delegate Aird lives in Petersburg with her husband and two boys, uh, and uh, we thank her for taking time out of her busy schedule to join us tonight. Delegate Aird, thank you for joining us, and the floor is yours. Well, assalamu alaikum, and good evening to all. Uh, and thank you so much for inviting me to be part of what is truly a historic occasion. Uh, while we are recognizing the milestone of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community's uh, centennial, I'd just really like to take a moment and say how historic it is that we are conducting uh, this ceremony um, and this occasion virtually, which I consider to be historic in itself. I think when we all look back at this momentous occasion uh, and the way we continue to prioritize unity uh, and all that unity represents by doing this virtually, uh, it will truly warm our hearts. So thank you for inviting me to participate. Um, as I considered your theme for tonight's celebration, I thought I would talk about a very real situation. Uh, and if I'm honest, it's truly consumed me for the last two weeks. And so it's really just been top of mind. Um, but I think that it's important for me to discuss it because it truly is most fitting for this occasion, especially uh, listening to the opening comments, uh, observing the video and hearing your mantra of love for all, hate for none. We've all seen in one shape or another how this pandemic has revealed some of the most difficult dynamics for our families, uh, neighbors, children, and what have you. Uh, and the community that I represent is no different. You know, two weeks ago, I was contacted regarding families in my community uh, that were living through this public health emergency uh, with no water as a result of disconnection for, from their utilities. Um, we could discuss how they got there, uh, the mishaps of their financial prioritizations. But the truth of the matter is, when you think about this very real situation, these are individuals that, while they're in their homes, 
they're unable to turn on the faucet to wash their hands. While they're in their homes, they can't clean their produce, their meats, to prepare their meals. Um, and simple things like being able to flush their toilets after use. You know, the list could go on, but I will end there and just remind you, this is present day we're talking about. Uh, when many began the challenge of trying to bring about a solution, the pressure of every minute, every hour, and every day uh, that passed, it was truly palpable. And in some instances, we felt like we were, you know, having every barrier thrown in our way. Uh, but we could not see ourselves giving up, so we just kept knocking on every door until we found one that would open. While we could not see the exact resolution, we kept trying and kept pushing. You know, the last few days have shown me, given this situation, strangers advocating for those who felt like there was a few being forgotten. Uh, they had no opinion in this matter or the situation, but they just wanted to help. And it's been like any, it's been unlike anything I've ever seen. You know, I can't say that those involved were all people of faith, but I can speak for myself and say that as a woman of faith, my prayer only intensified during this period. Uh, it intensified to clear my mind, uh, to give me a deepened sense of focus uh, so that I could hear with clarity and feel in my spirit the direction I was being guided in. And I strongly believe that without that guidance, I would be ineffective. You see, I know the power of prayer and faith. It is what gives us the ability to rise out of any circumstance, even when it feels impossible. It's like um, that bolt of confidence that moves us down a path, even when the direction we're traveling in is unclear. I can say that because literally as of this morning, I'm proud to, to say I received the uh, indication that We've identified a solution to this challenge, uh, of course, barring any unexpected um, elements, but these households will have their water reconnected. And I know that deep down in my soul and in my spirit, it's because of prayer. Uh, embarrassed, ashamed, and in a state of despair. That's what these individuals described to me that they were feeling. Um, but because of the collective faith and the collective prayer of so many fighting on their behalf, uh, the moment this need was shared, no more will they feel this. So as we continue tonight to talk about and reflect on the power of prayer, consider this as a subtle reminder and affirmation of just what it means and just what it represents in the everyday sense. Uh, thank you so much again for inviting me to participate and again, congratulations on your centennial. Thanks for sharing uh, that, Delegate Aird. You know, uh, when you were talking about the lack of water, and that's something Muslims can really empathize with right now because we can't drink water. So we can understand how difficult it was, but beyond that, that they couldn't even wash their hands uh, or use water in any way, shape or form. So it's, it's, it's so nice to hear good news. Uh, I won't call it a Ramadan miracle, but maybe I will. Uh, but uh, that's so great to hear. And, you know, I know you're really busy, but I want to give you a pop quiz, too. In the past two months, even though you've had a lot of things going on, have you been able to do something new uh, while everybody's been at home? I will say perhaps not exactly new, but it increased. So I have spent a lot more time, a lot more time outdoors. Uh, with my family and oftentimes I'm ripping and running from event in place to place and so while it's not completely new I would say it's a welcome addition to our routine so I'll, I'll take that as something new. <laughs> well we, we appreciate you taking time for us tonight. Thank you Delegate Aird. So next up we have um, Senator Ghazala Hashmi who is representing Virginia's 10th senatorial district and she is our newest elected member on this call, having been elected just last year. 
She's no stranger to our mosque, having visited last year during the campaign. And we welcome back, uh, we welcome her back today, in our virtual mosque and our virtual gathering. Uh, Senator Hashmi lives in Midlothian with her husband, and together they have two children. Uh, Senator Hashmi, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Salam and assalamu alaikum and uh, Ramadan Mubarak to everybody on who's uh, observing Ramadan. And my, um, uh, please excuse my crash that you might have heard. <laughs> my computer just fell over. So I'm going to try to hold it up. And I want to thank you so much for this invitation to join you this evening and uh, wish you Mubarak on the, on the uh, 100th anniversary of this very important celebration. Uh, I was delighted to visit the mosque a few months ago during the campaign and to meet so many members of the community and uh, have just really been touched by the way in which uh, the community uh, is an advocate for so many issues on social justice and the kind of humility that uh, so many of the members uh, demonstrate as they uh, do so much for everybody in, in our Richmond region. So thank you and Mubarak to all of you. Uh, I am um, uh, observing Ramadan too, and uh, it is uh, a very, very personal time for all of us uh, as Muslims when we are fasting and uh, abstaining from, from food, from water. But I think the greatest message of Ramadan has always been abstaining from impurities of any kind. And impurities meaning matters of the heart, matters of the spirit, uh, being very conscious and focused on what we say, what we do, and how we treat the other people around us. I know when I was a young child, I grew up in a very small town in Georgia, and my family and I, we were the only Muslim family um, so my parents had to demonstrate by example all matters of our faith. They were the only examples that we had as young children. And one thing my parents always stressed during Ramadan is that we could not say or do ill to each other. <laughs> and that was a challenge as young children. We always wanted to fight and I always wanted to beat up my older brother. But I, I knew dur during Ramadan that I had to refrain from all of that. And for me now as an adult, that's translated into how I conduct myself, especially during this sacred month that I try to keep my thoughts focused on uh, what is critical, what is important, and how we can continue to demonstrate compassion for um, people around us. And I just want to applaud our delegate, La Charisse Aird. I think she did perform a Ramadan miracle because she works so De deliberately out of compassion and uh, love for the people in the community, her constituents who reached out to her. There is nothing greater that one can offer than to offer the salvation of water and of uh, an ability to live in dignity that these uh, individuals were seeking. So thank you so much, Delegate, for your hard work and everything you've done. Um, for, for all of us now, this is such a period of crisis, but it's also a period of opportunity. And I know I've been talking to so many people who have seen this moment uh, where our lives have been disrupted profoundly, but they've taken this as a chance to reflect on what is so critical and important in their lives. And if we sit back and think about it, We've had time to be with our families, with our children, and with other people in our community in ways that we typically never get a chance to be. Our, our lives are so focused on activity and on achieving and on constantly moving. And for a few months now, we've been asked to sit still, to reflect, to think, to love, to show compassion. And that is truly the heart and the message of Ramadan too, that we reflect, that we are prayerful, 
and that we use this time to demonstrate charity and show compassion to the people around us. I've been really excited the past uh, weekends, um, for six weekends now, I've been working with the Islamic Circle of North America, gathering groceries and putting them in boxes and then actually driving them to the homes of individuals who don't have transportation and don't have the ability to go out and get, uh, get food and groceries for themselves. That has been a huge effort, but it's just been a wonderful way to connect with people in the community and then to actually um, show up at someone's door and bring groceries to them and to meet their children and their, their families and know that we are making a true difference. And, and I think this is what this month is all about. It, we have the opportunity to continue it and um, God willing, we will continue in this spirit of compassion and generosity for the, the period that when we come out of this crisis and uh, when we are back in our normal lives. So thank you again, Salman, for this opportunity. No pop quiz, please. <laughs> so I have, um, uh, I'm going to extend a wing of, of, of compassion to you. I was wondering, since you finished your first General Assembly, uh, <laughs> and it was a very stressful one, of course, it was a budget year. Um, did you have an opportunity to decompress before this whole crisis hit? You had about a two-week window. Were you able to do something? We actually did not have um, a time to decompress. You may remember that uh, we were finishing up our last few days. We had to extend the, the session. And so it was, I believe it was March 12th was our final day when we came back to vote on the, the final bills. And just as we were wrapping up our, our, our session that afternoon, uh, the governor also declared the state of emergency. So we, we had to transition fairly quickly. I was looking forward to some opportunity to decompress, um, but inshallah we'll, we'll have that opportunity later. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is uh, no stranger to our mosque as well, having come and visited NFTAR in the year 2018 during the campaign. Uh, U.S. Representative Abigail Spanberger is proud to represent Virginia's 7th Congressional District, which is comprised of 10 counties throughout Central Virginia. Representative Spanberger began her career in public service, first serving as a federal agent with a U.S. Postal Inspection Service investigating money laundering and narcotics cases, and then serving as a case officer with the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. You know, I hope Netflix is listening and that Narcos season four is all about Congresswoman Spanberger. Uh, this is an amazing career, and now she's a representative who was elected in 2018, finishing up her first congressional term, and uh, we welcome her uh, to our iftar tonight. Thank you so much for joining us, Representative. Well, Salam, thank you so much for having me, and the community is always so incredibly welcoming. Uh, it is always a pleasure to join at iftars, and uh, usually it's the best part is meeting people and being present um, and, and seeing uh, the joy uh, in the faces of those who are who are celebrating and observing this holy month. Uh, but I am in, in, impressed by how adaptive you all are um, and how adaptive this event is. And, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to follow uh, three, three state legislators. And um, in the spirit of unity, thank you for bringing so many of us together, allowing us to be a part of this event. Um, when I was watching the video that you showed, I was impressed by a couple of the references and the comments that they made about the Ahmadiyya, um, about it being a new dawn for a bright future. And I, I think this, this phrase struck me as pretty poignant right now because we are in this time of very difficult crisis for so many between health challenges, sickness, death that they may be witnessing, and of course, the economic hardships for those who are out of work and the children who are home from school, there's such an uneasiness. Um, but there also exists in, in the community and in the people I represent, a, a hope towards what comes next. And it is my hope that as we're looking towards what comes next, there is a focus on peace and justice and the importance of life because there's been some simpler quiet moments 
uh, as the stores have been shut and our normal day to day has been a lot slower. And I think about, you know, what sort of contemplation we have all been experiencing. And it's, it's not unlike uh, the elements of Ramadan where through uh, fasting, you have the opportunity to really be more focused and be more intentional. Um, and as uh, Senator Hashmi was saying, you, you set aside um, the, the negative. I wish my children would observe the rules and not fight with one another, as she said, she and her brother refrained from doing, but um, I might have her give my daughters a bit of a, a lecture later. But during this time uh, at, at home, when businesses are closed and our life seems to have slowed, while there is so much anxiety and there is so much pain, um, and, and like Delegate Aird uh, and, and Delegate Cox, I'm sure, and Senator Hashmi, I, I hear the stories from the people that I represent. Um, and there's stories of challenge and there's stories of fear, but there's also stories of hope. And I think during this time, we are able to really focus on what is important. We are able to celebrate little things. Um, I would argue that there's no other moment in time where you would be celebrating a, a starter for sourdough bread, but we are able to reflect um, on, on what is important and find bits of joy in some simpler things. And so it is, my hope for all of us, and, and particularly for everyone attending during this um, iftar event, that we reflect on uh, ways that we can bring a bit more peace and a bit more justice and a bit more importance to life, um, that we may bring the, the spirit of that reflection of Ramadan and, um, and the notion uh, certainly of the Ahmadiyya of love for all and hatred for none. And so I wish you all uh, Ramadan Mubarak. I thank you for inviting me and I look forward to coming back uh, in the future when we can all be together in person um, and share a beautiful, wonderful meal. Thank you, Representative Spanberger. And a lot of people might not know this, but your district has a lot of mosques. Yes. So you get to attend a lot of iftars and you probably okay. attend the mosque more than most Muslims do uh, during that month. There have been some evenings where I've had multiple iftars in an evening. And of course, I would never want to be rude or impolite and not give, not eat the entire plate of food that I have been given. Um, I, have, I have good manners when it comes to being invited to an iftar. So there have been some, some evenings where I enter my home joyously happy from having spent an evening um, jumping from, from mosque to mosque, iftar to iftar, but it's a pleasure to have such a vibrant community. And there was a gentleman in the video who said uh, that the Ahmadiyya, I think he said, are a twinkle in the constellation of the face of America. And I certainly thought that was a beautiful way to describe it. And I see that here in central Virginia. I, I represent so many people of uh, wonderful deep faith. And I've been so lucky and humbled to have always been welcomed by them. Well, thanks for joining us tonight and uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of the session. Absolutely. Now for our next, and our, our next speaker is somebody who for you eagle-eyed viewers may have seen in the audience of that video when the Khalifa was speaking at Capitol Hill. Senator Tim Kaine has a storied history in Virginia, having worked as a civil rights attorney mayor of Richmond, lieutenant governor, governor, and now U.S. senator. But before all that, a lot of people may not know this, he was a Jesuit missionary and he served in Honduras. So with that background, I'm very happy to welcome our own Senator Tim Kaine to share some reflections on what we are experiencing today. So um, thank you and a blessed month of Ramadan to all. It is a real treat to join the Ahmadiyya community and so many wonderful public servants and friends uh, in this gathering, virtual gathering, but I feel close to you as I see friendly faces on the screen. Um, let me offer three thoughts, a, uh, a congratulations on the centennial, a reflection on the Ahmadiyya community and the American value of religious tolerance, and some raw reflections on the challenging moment we're living through and how faith will help us get through that moment. So uh, to begin, congratulations on the centennial. Uh, 100 years ago, it, it must have seemed like a her just Herculean task to come to the United States and introduce 
the Ahmadiyya faith to the American public. But the value of love for all and hatred for none uh, was not a value that was foreign to the shores. Um, even if we don't live that way, the equality principle that all are created equal is very close to the value expressed in the Ahmadiyya community. 1920 was a powerful year. We were moving from war into peace. We were coming out of a global pandemic, the Spanish flu. Um, 1920 was the year where women in the United States were granted equality to be able to vote. So that was a propitious year. And 100 years later, I don't know what the Las Vegas odds would be about the Ahmadiyya community's planting of seeds in the United States and the roots that have flourished from those seeds. But it is, it is good to be here 100 years later and celebrate your accomplishments. And I'm proud to gather with you today. Say a word about religious tolerance, which is something that is so important to the Ahmadiyya Muslim community and also to our nation and to our commonwealth. A prominent American historian, Gary Wills, uh, describes the Constitution of America as one of the best borrowing jobs of all times. That the, the framers, while they made some significant mistakes, one of the things they did well was they searched other constitutions and gathered ideas to try to put together an amalgam of thinking about what democracy would be. Gary Wills pointed out that there were probably only two things in the original constitution of the United States that were truly original, that, that weren't in the founding documents of other nations. One was that war should not be a matter for the executive, but instead for the legislature to initiate, which is something that I feel very deeply about. But the second one was the notion of religious freedom um, that was first put into law in the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom by the Virginia General Assembly. The notion that you should not be preferred or punished based on how you worship or don't worship, um, but that we would have a climate that would allow all to worship or not as they please, and that would not only be good for individual liberty, but it would be good for the society as a whole. So much of history is about religious hatred and about religious division and about using religion instead of elevating and lifting to divide or conquer. But the Ahmadiyya Muslim principle of love for all and hatred for none is so close to that value, that First Amendment value of accepting all and encouraging all and, and learning from all in the choices that they make. That has made the Ahmadiyyas often the victims of persecution. I knew quite a bit about the Muslim faith, but I knew really nothing about the Ahmadiyya history until I taught a course at the University of Richmond called the Future of Equality at the law school. And we talked about the equality of religions in the American experience. And I had a student in my class by the name of Kasim Rashid, who educated me a bit about the Ahmadiyya. Um, and that was how I first learned about the Ahmadiyya. And I honor in you your commitment to an embrace of all traditions, because I think it is as Virginian a value, as American a value, as universal a value as exists. So thank you for being a witness to that important universal truth. And then finally, the moment that we're living in. I mean, I, I, I'll just state feelings that are raw and that are not processed or put into a good order. My heart goes out to you. Everyone on this call, I bet, knows people who have been infected with coronavirus. Uh, I do. Um, everybody on this call probably knows somebody or has some connection to somebody who has died of coronavirus. My wife, Ann, and I have three, three friends and a relative who've died of coronavirus. Um, Jeanette Galliano, my brother Steve's mother-in-law. Uh, Lois Shaver, the mother of our best friend in Richmond. 
Dolson Anderson. Some of you know Linda Sharp Anderson, who was an agency head when I was governor, and her husband Dolson died. I've known them for years. And then Gerald Glenn, a pillar of the Richmond faith community, who died. In addition to knowing people who've died, you probably have anxieties about your own health, about the health of people that you care about. There are probably people on this call who have lost jobs or know people who have, or who have spent their lives trying to build a small business and now wonder whether it will survive. My wife, Ann, and I have three adult children. Two of them are laid off their jobs because their jobs are closed. And so they have anxieties. We're, we're fortunate people, but even, even we as fortunate people feel very closely connected to the catastrophe that this is visiting upon the United States and upon the entire world. It does not fall equally on everyone's shoulders. The, but you know, the Bible, the New Testament says, I love this language, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, but it doesn't necessarily fall equally on everyone's shoulders. And certainly as we look at who is affected by coronavirus, who has died by coronavirus, it may be touching everyone, but it's not touching everyone equally. And so we are, you know, we're sort of forced back into these old spiritual questions. Why does suffering happen? What does it all mean? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about the book of Job these days, which is not only a book that's important to Christians, but also to Jews, and it, Job's story is in the Quran. And everybody knows Job's story. He he experiences a lot of suffering. Everything's going great for him, but then it starts to go badly for him. He wonders whether he's suffering because the universe is pointless and all his good works are for naught. His neighbors see his suffering and decide that he must be suffering because he's being punished. He must have done some bad things that we didn't know about, and so the suffering is a punishment. But the reader of the story knows that neither of those things are true. The reader of the story knows that Job is going through a trial, not because he was bad and not because the universe was pointless. He's going through a trial because he's being tested. He's being tested to see whether even in adversity, he'll cling to his faith, cling to his principles and values and not let go of them. The creator believes he will, and the devil believes he'll let go of his faith and principles when times get tough. And we know the story because he, even though he's mad at the creator, because he clings to his principles and faith and doesn't let go, at the end of the day, what was lost to him was restored. So in this time of great challenge, um, even when we can't exactly see the reason and we can't exactly understand why it's all happening, there is at least a, uh, a North Star out there a story that is sacred to all that says when you can't understand it and when you're mad about what you're going through, just don't abandon your faith and your principles. And if you don't, then the things that might have been lost will be restored. And that's my prayer for all of us. Um, we, claim, we, we, we hold to our faith in our religious values. We hold to our faith in the values of this country. And that's my hope for all of us as I join with you this evening during the blessed month of Ramadan. Thank you for having me tonight. Thank you very much, Senator Kane. Uh, I can't let you go without giving you a pop quiz, though. Okay, and you got to give me a Gosla's question, too, or, Ab or Abigail's, because she wouldn't answer hers. No, but I'll take one. So let's, you know, let's say it all ended tomorrow, and um, later this week, your fellow senator from Virginia invites you over for a celebration. And it's a lunch, a celebratory lunch. And when you come over, you see that he's making a tuna melt sandwich. What do you do? Um, I, uh, I announce that I'm engaged in a Ramad month of Ramadan fast, and I refuse to eat in the middle of the day if uh, Mark Warner is serving me his now famous tuna meltdown sandwich. That's a good answer. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, now we will um, uh, be joined by Imam Farhan Rabani, who is a missionary of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community USA. He was born in Pakistan and uh, immigrated to Canada to study at the Ahmadiyya Seminary School known as Jamia. And he graduated with the highest degree in Islamic theology. 
After graduating in 2012, he served in West Africa for a couple of years, then Canada, and then throughout America, including large parts of the Midwest, before he came here to Virginia in 2017. He's married and he has two lovely children and we are uh, happy to welcome him to our uh, event tonight. Imam Saab, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, first and foremost to all the wonderful guests uh, who joined us here this evening. Assalamu alaikum, uh, peace and blessings of God the Almighty be upon all of you. Uh, thank you uh, to all the wonderful speakers that went before me. It was really um, faith inspiring to listen to all of you. Today I want to share with you um, some words regarding the power of prayer, especially uh, during such times of uh, uh, difficulty and trial, such as uh, the time that we're experiencing now because of this current pandemic. Uh, it was 1893, a great scholar of Islam and Oriental studies from Southeast Asia by the name of Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. He wrote a paper in which he stated that prayer is a futile exercise. It serves no real purpose other than giving a sense of comfort to the one who prays and is meditating. A Muslim man at the same time from a very tiny village, a small village uh, in India, uh, Punjab province, answered this allegation. He did so because uh, this allegation, this point that Sir Sayyid had presented, it questioned the very premise of Islamic teachings that mankind can get closer to God and that God answers the prayers of those who call upon him. He wrote a book. He titled the book, Blessings of Prayer. In it, while talking about the efficacy of uh, prayer, he wrote, and I quote, when a child is being driven by hunger, cries for milk, then milk is generated in the mother's bosom. The child does not even know what prayer is, but his cries draw the milk. He continues by saying, this is a universal experience. Then how can it be that our cries before Allah, the exalted, draw nothing? If a person were to reflect on the philosophy of prayer, keeping in mind the connection and relationship which a child has with its mother, one would find it easy to understand this matter. This man was none other than the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, His Holiness, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, who claimed to be the second coming of the Messiah for the latter days. His picture you can see right behind me. Fast forward to the year 1902, India was ravaged by the Babonic Plague, which consumed hundreds of thousands of people in a very short span of time. Hazrat Ahmed, peace be upon him, had prophesied about this plague years earlier. And he was told by God the Almighty that the members of his community who are true in their oath of allegiance shall be protected. And everyone and anyone who resides within the four walls of his home shall not perish from this pandemic, not even a mouse, not even a rat. He informed the members of his community who were not yet fully immersed in the teachings of true Islam that they should take the vaccine prepared by the British government, but that at the end of the day, the true arsenal he and the members of his community had against this pandemic was reliance on God and the power of prayers. He wrote, and I quote, everything is obedient to God. Not even a leaf can fall without God's command. No medicine can heal without his command. One of the members of his community, Maulana Muhammad Ali became sick and the symptoms, all the, the symptoms that are generally associated with bubonic plague became manifested in his person. When it became obvious that this man is about to pass away from this, a message was sent to the promised Messiah, to Mirza Ulam Ahmed, peace be upon him. After receiving this message, he came uh, himself to see how Mawlana Muhammad Ali was doing. 
And he said, at that time, looking at Mawlana Muhammad Ali, he said, if you have contracted bubonic plague and you die as a result of it, then I am not from God. After saying this, he touched the forehead of Mawlana Muhammad Ali, who had scorching fever. But lo and behold, the moment Hazrat Ahmed, peace be upon him, touched this man's forehead, there was no fever at all. And all the other symptoms had subsided right there and then. This man lived for another five decades after that. You might be wondering if such miracles, if such uh, signs are still shown in this day and age. Well, let me share with you something which happened just a few weeks ago. One of the respected Arab scholars of our community, his name is uh, Brother Ibrahim Ikhlaf, who resides in the UK. Him and his wife, uh, Sister Reem, they both contracted COVID-19, coronavirus. And they have young children. So when their condition worsened, they wrote to the caliph of our community, the worldwide head, His Holiness Mirza Masood Ahmed, may God be his helper. You saw some of his clips uh, in the video, which was shown at the very outset of uh, tonight's iftar dinner. So the caliph started to pray for recovery of these two individuals, and so did the rest of the community the world over. Brother Ibrahim's wife, Sister Reem, she recovered rather quickly. But the condition of her husband, Brother Ibrahim, worsened very fast. One day she sent a message to the caliph that she is waiting to hear the words of comfort from the caliph regarding the condition of her husband. The person who carried this message to the caliph mentioned it in the beginning of the meeting. The entire meeting, you know, uh, was conducted and not a single word was uttered by the caliph regarding Brother Ibrahim's condition. It was only towards the very end of the meeting that the caliph looked up and said to the person who brought this message to him, he said, tell Reem, rest assured, nothing will happen to Ibrahim and he will recover from it. The man who was at the brink of death regarding whom the doctors had lost all hope was brought back to life through the power of prayer. We do not have to go far. Uh, you know, respected Senator, Honorable Senator also spoke about uh, how every single one of us knows someone who has been affected by COVID-19. We do not have to go far. We have someone on this call right now from Richmond who had contracted coronavirus. And through the power of prayers that the Caliph and the rest of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community were making on his behalf before God, is now completely well and is here with us today, this evening, on this call. We, the Muslims, are commanded to pray five times a day, every day, together in congregation at the mosque. Yes, this pandemic has forced our mosques shut, but it has done something remarkable. We have turned our small homes into small little mosques where we now worship five times a day with members of our family. While we also fast from dawn till dusk every day during the blessed month of Ramadan, we are reminded of the suffering of our brothers and sisters in humanity at large. And so we not only pray for our own selves, but for everyone else as well with the same love and sincerity that the that a mother has for her child the caliph has said do not let any day pass where you have not cried while praying to god almighty i end my speech tonight with the words of wisdom that my beloved imam the caliph of the ahmadiyya muslim community has mentioned in his sermon dated 24th of april 2020 and I quote, may Allah give wisdom to the governments of the world and may they not make any decision that leads the world to further destruction. May they make their policies with wisdom and may God help those scientists who are searching for, for a cure to this pandemic. 
Amen. And thank you very much for joining us this evening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Salam back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Imam Rabani, for um, powerful words and on uh, the example of prayer in the past and currently as well. Uh, now, we are at time, so uh, unfortunately, we cannot get your questions to respect everybody's uh, busy schedules for the weekend. But um, I did send an email out. If you have questions, feel free to email anytime, and we'll be happy to get those questions answered. Uh, for 100 years, we have laid firm on the cause that brought us to this great country to show the spirit of true Islam through sacrifice, service, loyalty to our country, and our motto, love for all, hatred for none. And that is especially true today when we must persevere through this pandemic. That's why we have turned the time we would spend at our mosques into time we spend serving our neighbors by participating in blood drives and food drives and so many other ways. Our mosques are America's mosques and we cherish our friendships with the interfaith community as we struggle to heal our country together. Thank you to all of our guests for taking time out of your weekend to join us on this electronic virtual iftar. And we anxiously await the day when we can host you in person. Uh, and as also, uh, as, as is customary in ending our programs, I would like to bring uh, Imam Rabani back on to close us out with a silent prayer. Imam Sab. Thank you so much. Uh, at this point, I am going to request everyone to join us in silent prayer. You're more than welcome to pray uh, however you feel comfortable. Uh, please join me in silent prayer. I mean. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Assalamu alaikum.